one. Hello, everyone. Um, let's just do it. I am very pleased to welcome Justin Chen, who's affiliated with ISERM. And Justin's going to tell us about differential primary decomposition of modules. Justin. Great. Um, so first, uh, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak in this uh, wonderful seminar. Um, I think this is a this is a this is an excellent sort of a virtual series. Um, and uh, so, okay, um, I, I want to talk today about primary decomposition. Um, so of various flavors, um, differential being one of them, um, hopefully also numerical as well. Um, I wanna focus on sort of general modules, okay? Um, I think typically primary decomposition is, uh, is well known for ideals, okay? But maybe a little less well known for, for general modules. Um, so uh, essentially everything I'm gonna say today is based on a couple of joint works. Um, so there's, uh, there's one with Yairon Sidruez, um, others with Mark Harkinen, Robert Crone, Anton Lakin, and then um, there's also a Macaulay 2 package, which sort of all five of us jointly have worked on as well. Um, so uh, before I get started, uh, just, uh, just a, a minor sort of technical note. Um, so I, I'm going to be writing on screen, and so uh, so to, to put my screen down, I'm going to actually turn off my video. Um, okay. All right. So um, just, to, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Okay. Um, what is, let me just sort of recall for you um, some basics of primary decomposition. Okay. Um, so maybe just as uh, some setup. Okay, so throughout, um, K will be a field. Um, I will typically take it to be of characteristic zero, um, especially for the differential parts. Um, of course, and there are some experts in the audience in characteristic P. Um, and uh, okay, so R is going to be a polynomial ring over K. Um, in N variables, Okay, um, right, and then uh, let me sort of take a, so R to the R is just gonna be, so this is a free R module of rank R. Okay, um, typically I'll use U inside R to the R to denote just um, a submodule. Um, U or, or sometimes M, okay. So, um, well, okay. So the, uh, in general, uh, what is a primary decomposition of an R much, okay? Um, so let's just say if now um, M is just some R module, okay? And uh, I guess this bit doesn't really need any of the assumptions, really only needs no theory in this, okay? Um, for all, all the modules I will talk about today will be finitely generated. Okay, um, so let's recall. Okay, so um, okay, so we can say that a submodule n inside m is uh, primary if the set of associated primes over R of m mod n is equal to a singleton set. So this consists of a unique prime ideal, um, let's say P, okay. So here we also say that N is P primary, okay? Um, so this implies, uh, for instance, that the radical of the annihilator of M mod N is equal to P as well, okay? Um, so, we can think of primary submodules as the building blocks um, in a certain sense for all, uh, for all submodules, OK? 
Okay. Um, so, okay. So, a fundamental existence result going all the way back to Emmy Neuther says that. Um, so, can attribute this to, to Neuther. Um, I guess for, for polynomial rings, one could um, also attribute an earlier result of Lasker. But um, anyways, the, so the existence result on primary decomposition says that these exist. Okay, so, um, so for any Noetherian ring, okay, and it's a finally generated R module. Okay, um, let's say non-zero. Okay. And then uh, n in m is any submodule. Then uh, there exist. Okay, so there exist finitely many um, in n i contained in m. Okay, so these are uh, n i is p i primary. Um, such that n is the intersection of these primary submodules. Let's say uh, just the letter T, okay, and I. Okay, so what this says is that uh, any submodule of a finitely generated module over an Ethereum ring can be expressed as a finite intersection of primary submodules. Okay. Um, so uh, this uh, so this is um, so we can uh, so we call uh, this expression a primary decomposition. Of, uh, of n inside m. Okay. All right. So, um, as uh, as stated, there's a, this is a this is a very sort of general result. Okay. Um, there's not uh, there's not too much that's canonical in this statement, although there's a, there's a little more we can say about sort of what can be made canonical. Okay. So. Um, for instance, we can uh, we can also talk about minimal primary decompositions. Okay, so um, we say that um, the decomposition above is irredundant. Okay, um, if uh, if essentially we cannot delete any terms in the intersection without changing the intersection. Okay, so in other words, um, if n is not equal to the intersection over all j not equal to i of n j. Okay, for any i. All right. If if dropping any one of the terms results in a in a different intersection. Okay, um, and we can also say that. Um, The decomposition is minimal if um, it is first irredundant and um, and these uh, these primes pi's are distinct. Okay. Okay. So one way to say it a little bit formally is that uh, this is equal to this, if and only if uh, i is equal to j. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what it means for a decomposition to be minimal. So it's irredundant and these associated primes are distinct for each component, okay? Um, so if we have a minimal primary decomposition, then, um, then the, the set of primes pi's are exactly the associated primes of m mod n, okay? And so that will sort of, uh, that will certainly be unique depending only on n and m, okay? Um, so 
of course, I should mention that uh, starting from any primary decomposition, we can uh, obtain a minimal primary decomposition. Okay, so you can sort of first achieve irredundance. Okay, and then among ir given irredundant one, you can always sort of make it make the associated primes pairwise distinct as well, um, just using the fact that an intersection of pre-primary submodules is again p-primary. So this is, so minimal primary decompositions always exist. Okay. Um, all right, so um, maybe just as a, just to give a sort of classic example, okay. Um, just to, to draw one, at least one picture, okay. So for instance, if we look at the polynomial ring in two variables, so this is, a, this is going to be somehow the, the first instance of a, of a non-trivial primary decomposition. Um, so if I take this classic ideal right, to be x squared generated by x squared and x y, okay. Um, this is this is a nice monomial ideal. Okay, it finds a it finds a subscheme of the affine plane. Um, so for instance, one possible uh, primary decomposition is given by this. So this is one possible primary decomposition. There are others, okay? Um, so, uh, so can ask sort of what is the, the geometric uh, meaning of primary decomposition? Okay, and this is, uh, this is where a large part of its importance stems from in fact is that primary decomposition uh, really gives an answer to, to what is an ideal or a module look like, okay? So when we visualize an ideal or a module, what we're actually thinking of is the primary decomposition, okay? Um, so, uh, so to draw a picture of this ideal, I will in fact draw the, the primary components, okay? So, um, so, okay, here is a, here is the, there's a line, okay? So this is, um, this is X equals zero. Okay, and then um, somehow embedded in this line, we also have uh, the line X equal, the point X equals Y equals zero. So that's just the origin, okay? Um, and, uh, and here, right, the primary decomposition is telling us, right, that somehow uh, this point, right, uh, has multiplicity, which is, uh, which extends out from the line, okay? Um, so somehow this embedded point has, has some extra multiplicity, which is not sort of, uh, which is not covered by the line, intuitively speaking, okay? Um, Right. And, um, and of course, one can sort of draw similar pictures really in, in this almost complete generality, right? So given any ideal um, in a polynomial ring, right? So it's uh, the corresponding subscheme of affine n space to really, to really visualize it geometrically, um, we would want to sort of describe the primary decomposition. Okay. Um, all right, so, uh, okay, so this is, um, this is good. Hopefully this is a, still sort of a refresher for everyone. Um, so next I want to, um, so I want to talk about sort of how, how one actually goes about computing a primary decomposition. So, um, I think most people uh, here are familiar with Macaulay too, okay? So if you're asked to, asked to, if you're given an explicit ideal and asked to find its primary decomposition, um, you, you could just go to Macaulay too and type it in, right? And ask uh, type primary decomposition of, of the ideal. Um, so uh, for instance, what, what is it that Macaulay too actually does right? when, when, you're at, when you ask such a thing? Um, so, so I want to I want to talk about um, a, a primary decomposition algorithm, which which I implemented in Macaulay too for modules. Okay. So, um, 
this is this is based on uh, based on the sort of uh, foundational work of Eisenblatt, Hunicke, and Vasconcelos in uh, in 1992, um, but somehow remained uh, sort of uh, not implemented for for a long time. Um, so um, just sort of drop a citation. Um, this is direct methods for primary decomposition. Okay. So, um, so okay. So here's here's a sort of general algorithm. Um, uh, well, actually, may maybe before the algorithm, let me sort of just mention that there are, there are some reductions we can make, okay? Um, so because we're working with general modules, we are able to make sort of general reductions. Okay? So um, that's, one, that's a one benefit of working with modules in general. So for instance, we can always uh, just pass from M to the quotient N mod N to assume that N equals zero. So, so we can talk about primary decompositions of zero. Okay. Um, and uh, we can even sort of, uh, we can even uh, it, pass from, uh, pass rings, okay? So if we were working over sort of arbitrary finally generated K algebra, um, we could actually pull back to the polynomial ring, okay? Associated primes and uh, intersections will behave well. Um, so this is one reason why, uh, why assuming that the polynomial ring, the underlying ring is polynomial ring is kind of a harmless assumption. Okay, so now, um, so, okay. So let's say we have uh, just a module over a finally generated module over a polynomial ring, okay? Um, so how would we um, go about finding a primary decomposition of zero? So uh, broadly speaking, one can divide into two steps. Okay, so the first step is to um, find all associated primes. Okay, so um, this set here, okay, associated primes of the module M. And then two uh, for each associated prime, Okay, find A, um, sort of emphasize the, this, uh, this article, A, uh, P primary component of M. Okay, um, so uh, A, the word article in the, Article A there is meant to remind you that uh, in general, primary components are not unique. Okay, um, so uh, so it turns out right. So for for minimal primes, okay. So for example, in this in this example, um, this is a minimal prime. Okay, there's there's uh, one minimal prime, and then uh, so the right the ideal x y. Okay, this is an embedded prime. Okay, the radical of this uh, embedded component. Okay, so uh, this in this example we have one minimal prime and one embedded prime. Um, so the primary components to minimal primes are unique. Okay, um, and so so those those sort of there there is not sort of much choice. Um, those, those can be uniquely determined. But uh, for embedded primes, there are always going to be infinitely many valid choices of primary components okay, for an embedded prime. Um, so, uh, so at some point, some, some choice is going to have to be made okay? um, so for, for the output of, of any program. So, uh, okay. So, um, so how do you actually do this? Okay. Um, so for step one, okay, this is a, this is a, for, for the question of finding associated primes of a module. Um, is actually quite a quite a beautiful piece of um, of homological algebra. 
Okay, so it turns out that, um, so uh, one can reduce um, computation of associated primes of a module, okay, to the problem of, to a, to a, to a special case, okay, to, uh, the special case of um, computing minimal primes of ideals. Okay, so uh, so let me sort of say quickly how this is done. Um, so uh, this is based on the following result. Okay, so um, the associated primes. of M of co-dimension equal to, uh, of a given co-dimension, let's say I, okay? Um, these are um, precisely the minimal primes of the following ideal, okay? So this is the annihilator of the ith x of M into the ring. Okay. Um, and these are also the ones of co-dimension I. Okay, so um, so uh, what this what this tells you is that uh, if you want to compute uh, associate primes of, of any module, um, what you can do is you can take a free resolution of the module. Okay, you can take a free resolution, then you transpose it. Okay, and then compute the homology at each spot of the transpose complex that will give you these X modules, X to I, N to R. And then you take the annihilators of each of these homologies, that's an ideal. And then we just need the minimal primes of each of these ideals. Okay, and then for each one, we only care about the ones of co-dimension exactly equal to I. Um, so this is how this is how one can compute associated primes. Okay. Um, all right. And uh, so next, um, now that we have all the associated primes, uh, how do you get a primary? How do you get a p primary component for a given uh, associated prime p? So, um, well, there are. Uh, Okay, so there, there are sort of two cases, okay, um, depending on whether or not the prime, the associated prime is embedded, okay. So, um, so for step two, okay. So if, um, if the associated prime is, uh, is minimal, okay, then, uh, So um, then uh, one can, then, uh, okay, it turns out the, uh, here, the P primary component of M is given by the kernel of the localization map from M to MP. Um, so uh, and this is sort of the, the nice case when we have a minimal prime, um, it has a unique P primary component and it is given uh, theoretically as the kernel of the localization map. Okay? Um, computationally, uh, there's still a, a small issue in that the, um, the localization M localized at P is no longer going to be a finite type over R. Okay? Um, so it cannot sort of just uh, just treat this as a sort of just linear algebra, okay? Um, but it turns out that um, that there are ways, okay? So um, so e.g. Um, so if we if we take um, some f, okay, if f and r is such that um, uh, f uh, such that let's say for all um, associated primes of M, 
Okay, f is in q if and only if q is not contained in p. Okay, um, if we sort of uh, um, take a take such an f. Okay, then uh, then actually this kernel m to m p is uh, is going to be equal to the saturation of m by such an element. Okay. Um, so this actually gives a very efficient way of computing the, the kernels of localizations. Okay. Um, so, uh, so in practice, this, uh, this seems to be the most efficient way of computing, uh, computing these uh, minimal or isolated primary components. Okay. Um, so these are for minimal uh, components. Okay. And then... Um, Okay, so then if, uh, if P is embedded, okay, um, then um, uh, there are other, then there are always going to be sort of infinitely many possible uh, distinct choices, all of which work, okay? Um, so here is one class of, uh, one class of valid choices. Okay, so then uh, for, let's say for J, for any J, which is sufficiently large. Okay. Um, so uh, there is this module, okay, which is going to be, um, okay, this is a valid uh, P primary component. Okay, so um, here, uh, <laughs> so I haven't sort of defined all of these. Um, so uh, let me not sort of go into too much detail here. Okay, um, this this hole is the equidimensional hole of uh, of zero in this module. Um, p p bracket j um, is a is the is, is the bracket power okay of the prime of this of the embedded prime p where I raise each generator to the jth power okay um, so uh, and and the point is for any sufficiently large j okay there is this this module which I can compute okay um, and that will be a valid primary component okay um, so uh, of course, one would one like to know, right? How how far do you have to go? How do you know sort of when a J is large enough to work? Okay, um, so one can sort of uh, treat this as follows. Um, so uh, right, so um, so in general. So one can compute. Um, sort of uh, Q primary. So this is in the case that P is embedded. Okay, so, um, so if we assume that P is an embedded prime, okay. Um, inductively, we can assume that we already have all Q primary components um, for Q, uh, an associated prime of M, which is strictly contained in P. Okay, so inductively, we can assume we already have these components. Um, and uh, we can also compute. Um, so uh, what we can also compute is actually the intersection of all uh, of all Q primary components for Q containing P. Okay, so um, so the intersection. of all Q primary components for Q, uh, so, so now this is sort of including Q equals P. Okay, so although the, the sort of individual P primary component is not well-defined, okay, necessarily, uh, the intersection of all the components for, for social primes contained in P is, okay? Um, and so uh, that means that if we have a candidate for a P primary component, 
okay, we can simply sort of intersect it with all the ones strictly contained in P and thereby uh, validate whether or not this candidate is correct. So um, thus, given candidate for, uh, for a P primary component, uh, we, can, we can intersect it with um, all components for Q strictly contained in P and check um, if this equals uh, the intersection of all components um, for Q contained in P. Okay, so so this gives us a uh, this gives us actually a rather efficient stopping criterion. Okay, so we can sort of um, we can just start trying these uh, these candidates these hulls. Okay, for 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 various small j's. Okay. Um, and then we check, does this intersection match? Okay, if not, we sort of increment and try again. And eventually this is guaranteed to work. Okay, so, um, so, um, so putting this all together, it gives this, uh, this iterative procedure for computing a primary decomposition of any module. Okay, so we first compute the associated primes. Okay, we, we take these, um, Annihilators of these X modules compute their minimal primes. Um, then we compute the minimal prime, the minimal primary components. Okay, those are sort of unique. Those are just given by these saturations. Okay, and then for embedded components, we sort of work iteratively. Okay. Um, so, so this is a this is a general primary decomposition algorithm. Okay, and this, this has been implemented in Macaulay 2. Um, it is available as of 1.17. Um, uh, uh, yeah, if there, are, if there are any questions, I'm, uh, I'm happy to sort of um, talk about, uh, I'm happy to talk more about this. Okay, um, so next, um, I wanna talk about differential primary decomposition as well. So differential primary decomposition is a, is a rather, ra rather recent notion. So, so let me sort of introduce some of this uh, notation. Um, Okay, so um, so using the notation as before. So let me take uh, U inside R to the R is an R submodule. Okay, um, and let, let me take uh, let me take a, a P primary submodule for now. Okay, so so U is a P primary submodule of R to the R. Um, and then, uh, okay, so a finite set of differential operators so uh, right, delta one to delta n. So this is going to be inside the while algebra. So uh, this is uh, okay. R and then um, we take the free non-commutative algebra, okay, um, over R on these new symbols d1 up to dn, okay, and then uh, we impose the the usual Leibniz okay commutator condition. Uh, that xi, uh, the commutator of xi with dj is equal to delta ij. Okay. Um, so if I have a finite set of these uh, differential operators um, with, uh, with polynomial coefficients, and the coefficients are, are elements of R, so we say that this, uh, we say that delta one to delta n um, 
R a set of Noetherian operators. Uh, for for you, if one can characterize membership in U by these finitely many differential conditions. So in other words, U is equal to uh, the set of vectors in R to the R such that um, each one of these vectors is brought into P. Okay. Uh, actually here, these are actually tuples. Okay, so these, yeah. So these are um, these are not just hoppers. These are R tuples of differential operators. Um, delta i of w is in P for all i. Uh, and actually, uh, let's not use m here. Let's say uh, let's say s. Okay, so um, sorry. This is this is what it means for a finite set of tuples of differential operators to be um, a set of Noetherian operators for the p primary submodular u. Okay, um, so right. How how does uh, right? I, I just say a little bit about the action. Okay, so uh, a, an element of the Weyl algebra. Okay, R join D1 to Dn. So this acts on the polynomial ring in the natural way by differentiation. Okay. And then if I have a tuple of differential operators that acts on uh, an element of the free module R to the R by acting on each component and then summing up. Okay. And so in this way, I get an element of the ring again. Uh, and then if uh, so, so right. What it means to be a set of Noetherian operators is that uh, U is exactly the set of elements in R to the R, all of which are knocked into P by, by all the delta i's. Okay. So, so Noetherian operators are give a finite uh, differential characterization of membership in this primary submodule. Okay. So, um, so we can, uh, so I think now, now we can also just uh, define a differential primary decomposition. Okay. Okay, so, um, so notice here that uh, you, in the definition of Ethereum operators, we require the submodule to be primary. Okay. Um, so now let's, let's consider the, the general notion. Okay, so the, in some sense, the global notion. So if now um, u inside R to the R is an arbitrary uh, submodule, so not necessarily primary, um, so then uh, a differential primary decomposition For you, okay, is um, so. Uh, this is going to be a list of triples. Okay, so the first element is going to be an associated prime. Uh, the second element is. Um, a little bit technical. So SI is going to be a set of variables which are a maximal independent set of variables modulo PI. Okay. And then uh, finally, um, I'm going to have a list of uh, differential operators, of tuples of differential operators again. Okay. Um, so, uh, so where, um, so PI is an associated prime of R to the R mod U, okay? Um, SI is a maximal independent set of variables um, so modulo PI, okay? Um, and 
uh, and we have the following. And so, okay, so these AIs are going to live inside. Um, okay, so here. Um, Uh, say here. Uh, so let me let me write this way. Okay, so R, and then um, I'm only going to um, so D I or uh, let's say D J. Okay, where uh, J is not in S I. Okay, so this this is a little bit sort of a using notation, okay? But here I want to take only the differential variables which don't appear inside the maximal independent set of variables, okay? Um, and these satisfy, um, okay, so this, okay, if I extend to the localization and then contract back, okay, this should be equal to, um, the elements of R to the R, which all the AIs knock into PI. J and W is in PI. So all parts of J in AI. Okay, so um, so here, right? Um, what sort of the important thing to, to keep in mind is this left hand side. Okay, so this left hand side here, um, right? This is not a primary submodule. Okay, what this is exactly the intersection of all uh, Q primary components where Q is contained in PI. Okay, this is exactly sort of um, this, this downward intersection. Okay, um, but again, sort of we, we have this sort of analogous differential, this list, finite list of differential conditions on the right-hand side, okay? So, um, so, so this, is a, this is what we call a differential primary decomposition, okay? Um, for, for this arbitrary submodule, okay? Um, so uh, I should say this, uh, this notion was introduced by uh, Yairon uh, Sidiris and Baron Sturmfels. Okay, and this is, uh, they introduced this in a paper that sort of first appeared this year. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, so um, they, they also managed, they also showed that uh, there is a good notion of minimality for a differential primary decomposition. Okay. So, um, so this was a, this is a theorem. Okay, so this is a series. Okay, so, um, so, uh, okay, so we can refer to the size of a differential primary decomposition as the sum of all of these sets, the, the size, the sum of the sizes of these sets, AIs, okay? Um, so this counts the total number of differential conditions that we need in this uh, differential primary decomposition. So that's, that's what we call the size, okay? Um, so they show that uh, any differential primary decomposition, let me repeat it this way, uh, has size at least at least uh, the so-called arithmetic multiplicity of u. Okay. Um, and then furthermore, um, so uh, a differential primary decomposition of u of size equal to the arithmetic multiplicity. Um, always exists. Okay, so so this means that minimal uh, differential primary decompositions we can define simply as those with size equal to the arithmetic multiplicity. Okay. Um, okay. So um, so I should say that. Um, so 
Okay, what uh, well, this is work with um, with the Iran. Okay, uh, so this is this here. Okay, so um, we can actually. Uh, so the way to the way uh, the way one can compute differential primary decompositions it relies on first understanding. Uh, first understanding sort of what are primary submodules from a differential point of view, okay? Um, so uh, this, 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 notion, this notion of Noetherian operators is, is key in this approach, okay? So um, yeah, what, what the whole machinery relies on is, is understanding what are primary submodules of an arbitrary, um, of, a, of, a free, of a free module. Um, in terms of differential conditions, okay. Um, so, so let me state sort of one of our uh, one of our main theoretical results. Okay. So if uh, P is a prime ideal um, of codimension C, and uh, and let me also call uh, F. The residue field. Okay, so this is a this is a fraction field of R mod P. Okay, so then um, there is a bijection. Okay, um, between the following four sets of objects. Okay, so first is P primary submodules. U inside R to the R of uh, of multiplicity um, of multiplicity, let's say M. Okay. Um, two is going to be um, sort of a a general uh, sort of algebra uh, algebraic geometry description. So these are going to be F points in the so-called uh, punctual quartz scheme. Okay, so this is uh, written this way. So this is called M of, uh, of the power series ring. Okay, over F in C variables. Okay, um, three is going to be uh, this is M dimensional um, F subspaces of, um, of this, uh, this ring, or sorry, this module. Okay. Um, okay, and then finally, um, so M dimensional F subspaces of um, the so-called while know their module. Okay, this is F um, tensor. Um, so just uh, okay. So um, okay. So not not sort of a, not without going into sort of too much detail. Okay. Um, there, there is a prime, there, this is a classification theorem for, for primary submodules, okay? And, um, and the, the third and fourth conditions lend themselves to, to this differential uh, description, okay? Um, so, um, okay, and, and actually sort of um, moreover, sort of important point is that um, any uh, F subspace, uh, so any uh, any f basis of um, of the subspace in uh, really sort of in three three or four um, okay. uh, can be lifted 
to uh, a set of Noetherian operators. Okay, for uh, for the submodule in part one. Okay. Submodule in one. Um, okay, so um, so this is uh, this is again a, a parameterization or or a sort of representation theorem for for arbitrary primary submodules. Okay, um, and uh, and the upshot of this this representation theorem is that this does give us a way to effectively compute differential primary decompositions. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe let me just say sort of um, a consequence is that um, so one can use this okay um, so and so in fact we do use this to uh, to uh, give an algorithm to compute Differential primary decompositions okay. of, uh, of submodules U inside R to the R. Okay. Um, and, uh, and what goes into this algorithm is, uh, is, is sort of superficially um, similar, similar to the, the previous algorithm. Okay, so here we had these uh, these two steps. Okay, first find the associated primes, then for each associated prime, find a primary component. Um, and uh, and here uh, to to give a differential primary decomposition, we also first need uh, to get the associated primes. Okay, which we um, we can again sort of use this uh, this X method, but then uh, uh, to get primary components or to get sort of uh, to get these uh, these differential operators, okay, these tuples of operators AI, okay, um, we can simply do linear algebra over um, over this function field. So um, so really the function field is where we invert the variables in SI, um, and then uh, and then pass through the residue field F, okay. But uh, the point is working over this, uh, working over this extended field and doing linear algebra over this. Okay, um, we can compute these uh, these these finite sets AI. Okay, which give the differential primary decomposition. Okay, and then um, so uh, one final note maybe that I'll make is that um, so um, given so. Given a differential primary decomposition, okay. Um, so this is right. This is this list of triples, pi, si, and ai. Okay. Um, of u. Okay. One can, uh, in fact, uh, recover the classical primary decomposition. Okay, so um, PI primary submodules, uh, maybe uh, we also call these uh, NIs. Uh, they are such that um, U is the intersection of these NIs. Okay, so. Um, so this, uh, this is actually sort of not entirely sort of obvious at first glance, um, but, but it is possible we also give an algorithm to do this as well, okay? Um, so uh, the, the upshot of this is that the differential primary decomposition also gives the classical primary decomposition. Um, so, um, Okay, uh, I think maybe let me end there for, for now. Thank you for your attention. All right, let's thank Justin. Questions for Justin.
so maybe this is a crazy question, but this uh, this theorem we showed us with this um, all these bijective correspondences, yes. you know exactly. Um, is there any chance, and and I'm not sure exactly what this would mean, but is there any chance of a version of this for um, finitely generated modules, right? So quotients of submodules of R to the R mod something. Um, of of you know maybe something like their their primary submodules correspond to something. I don't know what that would mean. Um, uh, so yeah, I. I I'm not quite sure what you mean. This this theorem is is about sort of uh, sub, sub modules of R to the R. Right. So, but but so I'm suggesting I'm, uh, <laughs> maybe it's a crazy question, but I'm suggesting is there hope for now instead of just sub modules of R to the R, right? But sub modules of R to the R mod something. So any finally generated module really is. Oh I oh I okay um yes so in fact uh yeah so okay this is this is one reduction which i which i failed to state um, but thank you for asking um i i've only talked today about uh some modules of a free module but this is sort of th this this easily sort of extends to just some modules of any finitely generated module um so uh so yeah this is uh, so is the correspondence here that um, maybe, I don't know, maybe the version three would be n-dimensional subspaces of, of quotients of that, that power of the polynomial ring? Yes. Um, so, uh, so essentially, okay, what, 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 what one can do is um, essentially just resolve. Okay, so if you have, uh, if you have say, say an arbitrary module, arbitrary finite module M, you write it as a quotient of R to the R, um, you, and then you can, you have first syzygies K, and then, uh, right, so, so primary submodules of M then correspond to primary submodules of R to the R that contain K. Um, and, uh, and, and so sort of just by, just by making sort of, uh, just by making sort of the, the obvious changes, okay, to sort of subspaces mm -hmm. that contain sort of a certain, uh, a certain other subspace. Okay, you can, you can generalize this to sort of, uh, to, to other to arbitrary finite modules. Great, thank you. Yes, Th thank you for asking. Justin, one thing I was curious about is, so like, for instance, the Eisenbud, Hunicke, Vasconcelos algorithm that you implemented, that one seem, feels to me computationally expensive. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, so the original paper of Eisenberg, Tijinki, Vasconcelos, um, I think sort of, uh, I, I think they were not so focused on, on optimization. Sure, sure. Um, and, and so some of the, some of the criteria that, for example, stop, stopping criteria are, um, are rather inefficient. Um, so for instance, um, I think I sort of, uh, yeah. So, so for instance, they um, th this this is this is one example of an optimization that I made. So, taking just bracket powers instead of ordinary powers. Um, okay. Ordinary powers, are sort of, if you have a large number of generators, will will in general take much longer to compute than bracket powers. Um, and uh, and they also, for instance, give a different stopping criteria than than this one that I mentioned here, um, which is uh, yeah. So so this. Uh, I think um, sort of, uh, yeah, there, there, there are of course a lot of sort of good ideas in, in the paper um, and with sort of careful, careful tweaking one, one can optimize them quite well. Um, and do you actually do this annihilator of X condition in order to, to calculate the associated yes. primes? Yes, yes, yes. Just um, feels very expensive. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that is sort of one, uh, one sort of uh, unnegotiable, not non-negotiable cost <laughs> to to this algorithm is that you, you do need the free resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but for instance, if uh, if you're only if you're only interested in say sort of the primary decomposition up to a given co-dimension, you can also sort of pass that information to only resolve up to this point, um, and this can be sort of this can give great savings as well. 
Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Justin? All right, well, let's thank Justin again.